I'm excited we're starting a new series today. Are you guys ready for a series about fear? Are you all ready to, to address the deep, dark secrets in your past and in your closet that nobody knows about? Are you prepared to be terrified? <laughs> okay, I'm not going to do that to you. I, I, but God might challenge you to look at some things that you might not want to look at. And the text that he has given me today, uh, you can find in 2 Kings chapter 6, starting at verse 15. And the title of today's message is, I'm Still Afraid. But... I'm still afraid. It's 2 Kings chapter 6. I know you all just got calm, but you know I'm going to ask you to stand one more time for the reading of the word. So whenever you get it, go ahead and stand to your feet one last time. I promise you until it's time to leave. 2 Kings chapter 6, starting at verse 15. But I'm still afraid. Did you all enjoy the, the series that we worked the last, well, the last few weeks? Yes. Amen. I had a lot of good feedback. Um, God just speaking to people. Amen. And people tell me I said things I never said, which is amazing. That tells me God was speaking, which is the best place to be. Amen. Second Kings chapter six. When the servant of the man of God rose early, that man of God that referred to here is um, Elisha, and the servant. Is, is new to follow Elisha. He's, he's, he's not well equipped, not well rehearsed in following this prophet. But it says, when a servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? And that, that sounds very spiritual, but the truth is, if, if we get into that context, if we were to make this more relevant today, it probably be some language I can't repeat from the podium. And then, what are we going to do? Oh no, what are we going to do? You have to understand the urgency of this servant's heart. He, he wakes up to discover that the enemy has completely surrounded the city. Alas, my master, what shall we do? Now I love his response. He said, do not be afraid. Don't you love it when somebody tells you how to feel when you're already feeling it? I'm angry, but don't be angry. But that doesn't help me. As a matter of fact, it makes me more angry. But go ahead. Tell me how I shouldn't feel sad. Or how I shouldn't feel mad or angry or, or disappointed. But there's those people, aren't there? And, and officially, Elisha is one of them. His response is, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed again to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. In verse 19, and Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. As he led them to Samaria. I want to talk to you today, really from uh, the interaction between the master and the servant. Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he says, do not be afraid. And fear is something that we all have in common. Uh, denial of fear is also something that we have in common. But right now, today, I, I, this is the foundational message leading into this series. I want to establish what exactly is the fear that is gripping you, what exactly is the fear that's hindering you from your growth, and we're going to look at it from a new perspective. Can we do that, church? So, Father, thank you for this word, and thank you for who you are. Thank you that we can come before you with our fears, and our doubts, and our insecurities, and our worries, and our concerns, and our sleepless nights, and our stressed out minds, our stressed out bodies, and you have nothing but grace and mercy for us. So Lord, I ask right now that you would help us learn to be fearless. We ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 And may be seated. Fear. Fear is a, fear is a funny concept. Because the truth is that not all fear is bad. Can, can we agree on that? As a matter of fact, you're here today and you've survived this long because of some form of fear. You learn not to touch a hot stove. Why? Probably because you did it once. 
but then gain a reverence or a fear for that heat. There's a reverence, a, a rational fear, but then there are irrational fears. Who's afraid of snakes? Be honest. I don't have any here, I promise you. Okay. Um, spiders. Spiders? All sizes? Doesn't matter? Okay. Now, a spider riding on the back of a snake. Anybody? <laughs> irrational fears. I have an irrational fear. I shared once in church. I've been it, but I'm about to do it again, so I guess I didn't learn my lesson. Um, when I was a kid, I lived up in New York, and there was a story that came out on the news about a snake that had crawled through the sewer system and come up into the toilet. And I'm going to tell you right now, it traumatized me. It traumatized me. And the reason it traumatized me is because we had a broken toilet. And, or as my father would say, toilet. And it, what would happen was when you would, I don't want to be that you know, explanation of it, but when you would sit on it long enough, eventually every 30 seconds or so, it would go, and it would make a noise. It had always done it. I was used to it. But now all of a sudden, I started to make sure that it's like a snake coming up through the pipes. And I'm like in the most exposed position possible. And this is going to be me. I'm going to be on the news that a snake bit me. Or I'm, I just, I'm all this imagination of what's going to happen. I'm not going to lie. This, I'm going to be real with you. To this day, I still check. I, I'm just putting it out there. And, and if I showed you the picture that was burned into my mind, you would check too. It is terrifying to think that something that could potentially hurt you or or at least attack you in, in the most vulnerable spots of all could be inches away from you. And so I was about five or six and it, it seared into my mind. And to this day, I still check every single time I go in. And Lord forbid, if the, the toilet flushes or make those automatic toilets, like if you move a certain way and it flushes, I freak out. I'm just being real. It's an irrational fear. I know that. And what I'm realizing is, is that there are so many irrational fears that we had justified and explained and we accept to be normal. The truth is, I'm now 35, and not once has a toilet come up through the, the drain into my toilet. Has never, and the snake has never once appeared, and yet there's still an irrational fear. And in this text, I want to say it's not an irrational fear what we're hearing from the servant. He's responding to the situation. The truth of the matter is, there are warriors surrounding him. The enemy has surrounded them. Not just men with swords, but they're on horses and chariots. I mean, everything in the facts says that he has a right to be afraid. Would you agree with that? And I want to tell you, there are things in your life that you have a right to be afraid about. There's worrying about your children, worrying about your finances. I don't want to say worry because that implies anxiousness. We're not supposed to be anxious, but we pray about everything. But the truth is, let's be real. We work, right? I mean, I, my kids go out the front door to get something off the front like area, and I freak out. Like, is somebody going to drive by? Is somebody going to take them? They're beautiful. Like, I don't, and, and my imagination runs wild. It's a rational fear, but my imagination makes it irrational. And this is where I think most of us find ourselves when it comes to the details, the, the story, the narrative of our lives. We get so caught up in our imagination that we start to go irrational with things that have every right to scare you but shouldn't keep you up at night. Are you with me so far? Yes, yes. And so I want to go into this. There are some rational fears. Like I actually, I did a lot of research. I typed it into Google. <laughs> don't act like you don't do it. That's the first place, unless you're a Yahoo person, but there's not that many Yahoo's anymore. Um, I typed it in, how many people have irrational fears? And it started going through what type of irrational fears? I said, okay, what's a rational fear? And it gave me a list of them. And so I took out a couple, but, but fear of losing your spouse, fear of not being able to provide for your loved ones, fear of children getting hurt, lost, or taken advantage of, fear of heights, snakes, spiders, fear of public speaking, fear of being alone, not finding love, not being wanted, fear of change, fear of growing older, fear of losing parents, fear of physical or mental health declining. These are all rational fears. It's a part of life. Fear is a part of life. And so when I tell you that I want you to be fearless, I want you to say not fearless. Because fearless isn't reasonable. It's not possible. It's not possible to, for you to be without fear. But you can fear less. You can choose to make a decision to fear less. And so I want to encourage you, don't think, and I, I know that men tend to be more like this, but like, 
nothing scares me. Like right now, people that have a snake, I'd be completely, I wouldn't, I wouldn't freak out on the outside, but on the inside, I'd be screaming like my little son. Like, but we like to put up this facade. I'm not afraid, nothing scares me. Anybody like that? Like, yeah, nobody? Nobody's gonna raise your hands. Thank you. One honest person, I'm praying for all y'all to repent. Because the pastor just asked a question in church in front of Jesus. And now one of you are honest with me. We do. We, we cover up how we really feel, what we're really experiencing, what we're really going through. Because we, we think it makes us look weak. And so I have the first point. Are you ready for the first point if you want to get into this? While it's impossibly fearless, I do believe that we can fear less. So it's not about being fearless. Because we're convinced that we have to relinquish everything that scares us. We have to give up everything that brings fear into our lives. But truly, we are called to have less fear. That's it. That takes a burden off your shoulders. Do you realize that? You don't have to walk around acting like you're the most macho man, not afraid of nothing. You can scream and jump up on a chair because a mouse ran through and nobody's going to judge you but your spouse, your kids, and your family members. But the truth is, fear is normal. And accepting that is the first possible thing you can do for yourself. It's, it's not about being fearless. It's not about thinking that, well, God, and, and this is where we get twisted in Scripture, well, God says that perfect love casts out fear. Amen. Amen. And it does. Irrational fears. Love, the love of Christ, the light will shine darkness on your irrational fears. It's not going to cast away every, every fear that you have. The love of Christ is not going to make you all of a sudden okay with heights. I'm not going to do that. Now there's a way to overcome heights. There's a, a way to overcome fear of spiders and snakes and all these things. But you don't need the love of Christ for those things. You need the love of Christ to, to conquer the fears that are irrational that don't make sense. That the enemy uses when he speaks into your mind. Can I give you an example? This is, this is one I, I came up with. I'm like, I, I think this is perfect. I've heard something similar. But there was a woman who was convinced that her husband was going to leave. Her husband was going to leave. They had kids and they had this whole life built together. They had a business together. And she was convinced because he came home acting a certain way, talking a certain way. She was convinced he's going to leave. Me. And so if that wasn't enough, the enemy whispers into her ear, you're right, he is going to leave you. And so all of a sudden it turns into, well, if he leaves me, how am I going to take care of the kids? How, how, how am I going to work to provide now and take care of my kids? How am I going to do that? He leaves me, but, but if he leaves me, how am I going to survive? How am I going to get through this? How am I, I going to be okay? Because if he leaves me, I, I don't know if I can even get out of bed in the morning. What's going to happen if I get depressed and nobody else wants to marry me? And now my kids are growing up without a father. And that's that's detrimental to their mental health. And now what if nobody else wants to be with me? Now here I am in my old age. I'm in the tub. I slip. I fall. I hurt myself. I can't get out. I'm in the tub. My kids don't talk to me no more because they're mad. My father, their father left. And so my kids don't call me. So I'm sitting in the tub. I'm hungry. And I'm naked. And I'm scared. And I'm starving. And then my kids are going to find me. My body's going to be there like decomposing. And they're going to freak out because they saw my body. And they weren't there for me. And now they have a guilty conscience. But now because they're guilty conscience, they're going to be driven into drugs. And because now they're doing drugs, their children, my grandbabies, the love of my life, my grandbabies, are going to turn to crime because they have parents that are now addicts because of me and my husband, and it's his fault. <laughs> and so he gets home from work, and now here's the thing, he's mad because he had a bad day at work. You've developed this whole narrative how he has completely destroyed every future generation you possibly could have had together. Your children are only five years old, and you are convinced that your grandbabies are going to be criminals because your husband's going to leave you. Does that sound crazy? Yes. That is the irrational fear. And here's the thing. It might not be the same story that we tell ourselves. Every single person here, you have an irrational fear. A story that you made up about a situation. Do you want to know what fear is? Fear is the sum of our past events. And we project it onto what we think the future will look like. And so if somebody hurts you in the past, and now here it is, somebody's coming into your life you care about, you automatically project onto them what happened to you in past relationships. That is fear. And, and, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing to a degree because if you touch a hot stove in the past, you learn what? Not to touch a hot stove. But here's our problem. Our memory is horrible. Do you agree with that? I know some are like, no, I'm really good. I do, I do puzzles every morning. I have a great mind. No, your, your mind, your memory is horrible. That means the way you look at the past and how you perceive the things that happen to you, it's jaded, it's faded, it doesn't match the truth. And yet you are defining future decisions based on how you saw the past. Do you see a problem here? 
And so the enemy sees a weakness, and that's what the enemy will attack you. He will say, well, yeah, you were abused because of X, Y, and Z. And he'll turn it into this whole dialogue narrative that you were the victim. Everybody was out to get you. It's everybody else's fault. Protect yourself. And now every relationship going forward, you are going to sit there and be defensive and offensive, and you're going to accuse and attack just to make sure that it never happens again. Irrational fear causes damage in our lives. It causes damage in our relationships, in our relationship with God, with others, with our children. It impacts every area of our life. And so while rational fears are normal, acceptable, there, there's nothing wrong with rational fears. Irrational fears have a way of crippling. They have a way of keeping you up at night. They have a way of, of stopping your growth. They, they, they challenge you in your faith. Irrational fears can be detrimental to your health. Do you understand that? In every, in every aspect of your health, irrational fears are, are the enemy's tools to keep you at bay. You are in chains and you are locked up. And we're looking at this text. And the reason I'm going into all this about irrational fears and rational fears based on this text is because if you understand the full story in 2 Kings chapter 6 and what's been happening, you would understand that it is irrational for this man, this servant, to be worried about what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a little bit of context. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 6, you would read that, that Elisha has been giving the, the king of Israel little tips. The, the king of Syria is attacking, setting up booby traps, setting up stations to take down the Israel nation. And the prophet is going to the king. God is speaking to him about what's going to happen. And Elisha is saying, avoid this area, avoid that area, don't take that around because they have camps based right there to capture you. Avoid it, go around. And so now the king of Syria is frustrated. Because these are things that are being said in confidence in, in his bedroom among his, his servants. Nobody's supposed to know this outside of Syrians. And so he calls in all of his men and, and he says, which one of you is for Israel? Which one of you is working against me? And the, the one man boldly stands up and he says, no one, sir. Not one of us is against you. The problem is they have a prophet, Elisha, and he's telling his king and his people everything that you're saying. Everything you have plans, they know in advance. And so this is happening. So the king says, we need to take him out. We need to take out Elisha. Let's send our troops. Let's go to the city where he is sleeping. Let's find him. Let's surround him. Let's take him over. The reason this is confusing to me is because clearly the prophet can predict what you're going to be doing. Do you see the, the, the circumstances here? Elisha knows what this king is doing. He's forewarning the entire nation of Israel. And yet this nation of Syria thinks that they're going to take him out. And this is where we pick up in verse 15. It's the servant wakes up to realize that they are fully surrounded by these, these chariots and these horses and these men who are out to kill them. But now, if he knew anything about Elisha, he should know that it was expected. If you spent enough time with our father, the things that are happening to you, you would actually expect. To some degree, there's nothing that would ever happen to you that you would be caught off guard by. Do you understand me, church? Do you see what I'm saying? If you were spending enough time with God, he would be speaking to you. He would be ushering you into specific avenues and avoiding certain roads. But the problem is most of us don't even get into the word of God. And listen, I try to do my best. I look you up on Sundays, but come Tuesday, you're on your own. I mean, it's, it, you are responsible for your own diet. God wants to speak to you unless you're talking to me at 2 o'clock in the morning and he's speaking through me. You're on your own. So if you're not listening to the guidance of God, and he's trying to, to protect you against certain people, and certain actions, and certain reactions, then you're setting yourself up for failure. See, this, this, this servant was with his master. He was exactly where he was supposed to be. But he forgot about the past. He was with Elisha when he said all these things to the king of Israel. Don't go there. I'm warning you that they had traps set up, and every single time he was 100% accurate. Yet somehow he thinks they slipped in on him while they were sleeping. You want to know the real problem? He, he didn't think it was Elisha that got caught. He thought that God was sleeping on the job. That's the truth. For, for Elisha to be sleeping and for the enemy to surround this servant must have been convinced. God didn't tell you something. God didn't prepare you for this. What are we going to do? 
Now, I love his response. Don't be afraid. Matter of fact, we can go to point two. You ready for point two? And pay attention to this film, please. Your butts love fear. Pay attention to this spelling. Your butts love fear. Not double T. <laughs> Single T. Your butts love fear. Do you know why? Because when an irrational fear pops up and somebody tries to speak logic into your life, what do you respond with? But. Well, I'm worried I don't have enough money and I, I, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. But God's a provider. But you don't understand. Every irrational, imaginative thought that you have begins with what? Your butts love fear. It gives your butts authority to decide where you're going to go. Single tape. Right now. Do you have butt statements? Do you have one? Think about it for a moment. You need a healing. Is it possible? Do you believe God heals? Do you believe God redeems? Do you believe that God resurrects? Yes? The, the people in the front. Do you all believe that God resurrects? The people in the back. Do you all believe that God resurrects and He redeems and He has unlimited grace and mercy and love for your life? Then why don't we follow any sentence with but unless it's followed with God? But God makes sense. You got me. You're good. You're in a good place. Everything looks really bad. It's falling apart. But God is a good place to be. But when I tell you that your life seems like it's falling apart and it feels like it's sand and it's falling apart between the fingertips and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to survive this. If you fall up with a but, that's where my issue comes in. Because your but loves and feeds off of your fear. And some of us like it. You won't admit it. I know that. You won't admit it that you like it. But there's a part of you that you like that fear. It feels comfortable. But, but, you don't understand my situation. Because they see my bills are due. If I can't pay them, what's going to happen? My kids are sick. They're struggling in school. They don't pass. If they don't do well. You don't know what's going to happen. But God said this is what you don't understand. You don't understand. I mean, put ourselves in different categories. If God is outside of our reach, we separate ourselves from the will of God. It's possible for everybody else, but it's not possible for me. You see, but doesn't apply to God when it comes to me. Your but loves fear. Your but thrives off of fear. And in this conversation, it's funny, you don't hear the reaction of the servant. Elisha automatically goes into, do not fear, do not be afraid, and he prays for him. Or to open his eyes so he can see that there are more of us than there are of them. I have to tell you that even in the midst of all that, there must have been still some fear inside this young man. There has to be something inside him still. And so the second point is your butts love fear. It's called the spiral effect. It's where you continue to keep going and going and going and giving you every possible imagination story that could happen. And this is what I want you to do. Hit rock bottom. You hear me? So if I ask you, well, what happens if your spouse dies? Well, then, I, then I, I, I have to raise my kids by themselves. Okay, if you have to raise your kids by yourselves, then what happens? Well, then I have to figure out how I'm going to pay for everything. Okay, but what happens after that? Follow the money trail long enough until you hit rock bottom. What's the worst thing that happened? You and your family dies. Guess what? You're with Jesus. I don't know who wants to hear that, but that's the truth. So follow it through. Don't get caught up in the middle of the money trail to spiral, but allow the spiral to hit rock bottom. For a lack of better terms, let your butt hit rock bottom, double T. <laughs> let it hit. Come to a place where you are so grounded that there is no other alternative, that the worst of the worst, you know exactly what the worst of the worst could be, because at that point you can start to climb back out again. Do you hear that? See, most of us get to a place where everything just seems impossible, and we get caught right in the middle, and that's where we want to hang out again. Follow it through. Keep going. Whatever that fear is, whatever your doubt is, follow it through and see where rock bottom is. Because I promise you, as soon as you get to your first step, it'll be a step of faith. Okay, I know that this happens and it's going to be really hard, but God. The but God follows when you reach rock bottom, you have no place else to go but up. Amen. You ready for point three? Yes. Ready? Set yourself up. 
That's what this was. Read the context again. Elisha is predicting, prophesying every single spot that the Syrians are going to attack where they're going to set up camp. Yet somehow this prophet, this man of God, has performed more. I mean, just moments before this, he made an iron axe head float in the water by throwing a stick into the river. I mean, this man is clearly tapped into the anointing of God. He has the power. He's prophesying. He's predicting. And yet somehow he's caught off guard sleeping when he's surrounded by the enemy. Do you think that it's possible that God allowed this situation to happen? That the, the prophet was fully aware that all of this is just simply a setup for the servant? Do you think that? Because that's what I think. And you're probably thinking, well, who's the servant? Who are you? Who are you? But guess what? God still goes out of his way to reach you. And he'll use people of power and people of authority over you to speak to you. You see, in this equation, in this story, we are the servants. Do you get that? That we are following somebody that we're just trying to understand. And we've heard some things and we've seen some things, but the truth is we can't grasp what Elisha has in common with God and what God is doing through him. We can't, but we can follow. And sometimes the most terrifying places happen when you are following Jesus. He will bring you into places and situations that will not make sense. And he will challenge your faith, and he will challenge your, your comfortableness, and he will challenge your fears, and he'll come at you right where you are. And this is where we find the servant. Waking up, being surrounded by the enemy. Does anybody feel like that here this morning? That no matter what you do, it feels like you're just surrounded by the enemy? That you try to do better by yourself, or better by your kids, or better by your, your company, or just trying to be a good person, yet it seems like you're just surrounded by the enemy? And I'm not talking about the, the people in your life that talk. I'm talking about the enemy, the actual enemy, the one who's spiritually trying to destroy you. That it seems like no matter how hard you try, that he's always right there. And here's the truth. He is. Do you understand that? Y'all, okay. Here's, here's my concern. And this is all script. I know this is playing right here. My concern is that if you've accepted Christ into your heart, number one, if you believe that he is your savior, if you believe that he has risen you to life from death, is a basic foundation of Christianity. If you believe those things, if you have surrendered your life to Christ, you're a target for the enemy. Yeah, that's right. I, I really hope that you got that. Amen. I don't want to be like a downer, because if you read on, go into Revelation, we win. Praise God. Like we got the playbook. We know how this all ends. But if, if you are a target and you're not aware that you're a target, you're stepping into booby traps that you have no idea how to handle. If you're not aware of the fact that the moment you accepted Christ, that you became alive and you became a threat, that your words, your prayers have power. Like, I love that you come to church, but y'all need, need to be the church outside the church. And so like, when we go out, you have a target on your back. The, the world will not like you. I'm sorry for most people that want to be liked by everybody. The world will not like you. The government will not like you. Other religions, other idols, they're not going to like you. The devil, the enemy, he's not going to like you. Because you are a representation of Christ here on earth. And so you need to be prepared for battle. You should never be waking up and being caught off guard by a battle. Are you kidding me? And that's where the servant finds himself. He was caught off guard by the soldiers surrounding him. Elijah wasn't worried. He wakes up and he looks down and goes, okay. This is fun. Let, let me open your eyes. Let, let me show you what you're missing. And he opens his eyes to realize that in the spiritual realm, it's really never about the physical. It's never really about the people who are, who are attacking you in the world, but it's in the, it's in the spirit that the battle is happening. So it's never about what you see in front of you. You think it's about cancer. You think it's about sickness or finances. It's not. It's a spiritual battle. That's what this always comes down to. And Elijah was prepared for battle. Elisha woke up in preparation. He knew exactly this is a setup. Do you get that? The servants being set up to develop a new level of faith. And some of you right now are walking through some really hard times. You can even describe it as hell on earth. And you are walking through because God is setting you up for a new level of faith. Do you hear me? So I understand it's I, I, look, I understand it's not fun. I understand that the circumstances like for lack of a better word suck. And I understand that you don't want to go through what you're going through right now. And I understand you're trying to get out of it the best that you can. But maybe God has you right where He has you for a reason. 
And maybe no matter how hard you try, you can't see death, but he doesn't want you getting out of it. The servant could have tried to escape. He could have tried to run. He could have tried to flee or hide. Or he could have done something. He goes to his master and goes, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And the problem is a lot of us go to other servants asking them, well, what should I do? They can't help you. Your, your girlfriend, your, your boy, they can't help you. They, they can't. Ultimately, it has to come down to you actually going after the master and saying, I'm stuck. I'm, I'm about to go into battle. I don't know what to do. And guess what God is going to say to you? Are you ready for this? This is how deep the Bible is. Are you ready for this? Don't be afraid. How aggravating is that? Let's be real. How aggravating? Because I'm already afraid. What do you mean, don't be afraid? Every single time, 365 times in the Bible, it says, fear not. But that's isn't about fear in general. And I love to say, well, it's about fear not. For, for one time, one day, the entire year, 365 times, God says, fear not. I'll, if I'm being real with you, like, I can use up that 365 in like a week. Okay, like, I, I love the idea, like, he, God says it one time for each day of the year. That's beautiful, but I don't think that's really what he intended. Fear not, every single time God spoke that, look back, and every single time it's fear not, it's when these people were out to take a step of faith, and they had no idea what was going to happen. They didn't take the step of faith, and, and they're in the process of taking a step of faith. Fear not. We just spoke about Joshua, right? He's going out to help the armies. He's going out to help the city that's been taken over. And he's about to go into battle for them. And in the process of taking a step, not knowing what's going to happen, God speaks to him. What's he say? Fear not. I've already placed them in your hands. Fear not. Your fear not, your, your overcoming fear is going to be the irrational fear. And here's the best part. Are you ready for the turn? This is the, the pivot. This is the moment, the climax of the, the story, the movie, where I hit you with something you never saw coming. Are you ready for this? I already told you your irrational fear is linked to your past. Right? It, it, it determines how you see the future. Your imagination is where your fear exists. And we think that we have to have some kind of magical power to overcome our fear. Only Christ can do it. You want to know how you overcome your irrational fear? Face your past. Did you catch that? As a matter of fact, irrational fear is just your past in disguise. That's all it is. It's that thing that you went through that, that hurt you. It's that thing that you went through that you thought was going to destroy you. It's that thing you went through that has defined you up to now, that has developed into an irrational fear, and you are convinced that it's going to happen again. And, and, and you think, like, God is all sleeping somewhere, and he's not protecting you, and, and you're going to wake up and be surrounded, and you have this irrational fear. Every single person in here has an irrational fear. And I'm not talking about snakes and spiders. I'm talking about you have an irrational fear that has prevented you from going to God, that has stopped you in your growth in some aspects. An irrational fear that is literally just your past and what you have not dealt with. It's the thing that hurts you in the past that has you stuck. Do you hear me, church? Do you hear me? It's, a, it's when you were betrayed. That, that's the fear that has, has crept into your life. And it's when you lost someone that you love and you didn't get to say goodbye. It's that fear of losing someone and not being able to say what you have to say. It's the fear of watching someone you love get older and change. And it seems like every single time you see them, they look a little brighter, a little older, and they're, they're weaker. And, and, and it terrifies you because you feel like that's your fate, too. And so you're terrified of growing older, and you're, and you're terrified of change because change means something new and uncomfortable, and I don't want to change. I like, but here's the thing, God will always drive you into change. God will always push you into change because it's necessary for growth. Throughout scripture, we see over and over again this representation that newness implies that you have to have change. You can't put new wine into old wine skins. It requires a change of circle, a change of atmosphere, a change of heart. And so I want to I want to ask you to stand just for a moment. That this, this is the foundation of us going in in the next few weeks. I'm going to be talking about specific fears 
that we are taking out of context that the word of God says we should not be afraid of those things. Well, I need to understand the difference between a rational fear and an irrational fear. I need to understand that your imagination is your worst enemy when it comes to the things that bind us up in this world. That most of the time, the thing that we're terrified of is something that hurt us in the past doing it again. And so we trust less. We, we love less. And we fear more. And so I believe if we can learn to fear less, then we will love more. That we will have more grace, more joy. And am I talking to anybody right now? Are, are, you, are you looking for more joy in your life? Are you looking for a happiness, a, a contentment, not with like everything being perfect, but find contentment in the middle of the storm? The Holy Spirit wants to show you right now. There are things that He wants to address from your past. And it's probably the most terrifying thing you will ever do in your walk with God is to have to address the things that hurt you before you met Him. But it's where you will discover healing. And so I, there's symbolic, like we talk about, raise your hands and, and open your palms to the heavens. And the truth is, you can, you can do that, but if you're not making a decision inside your heart to lay these things down, to allow God to show you the, the things inside your heart that's poison, the, the, the weeds that are growing up with the, the Word of God that will choke it out, will choke out the life if you don't uproot the weeds. Who has weeds? I better see every hand in this place. Because if you ain't got no weeds, you don't need to be a church. You got, you got a clean heart, an open heart, you ain't got no wounds, you've never been hurt. God has been walking side by side. As a matter of fact, since you left the womb, He has been carrying you to this very moment. You don't need to be in church. You're basically in heavenly places as we speak. But if you are like me, if every time you develop a, a, an understanding that God loves you, and then as soon as He realizes, like, I love you, so we're going to look at this, and it terrifies you, we're in good company. Amen? Amen? So with all of us weeds up in here, I want us to take our hands, and it's going to be awkward for some of y'all, I get it, but raise your hands up. Put them up as high as you can, comfortably. I know y'all forgot deodorant, and it don't matter. It don't matter. Raise your hands up. This is a sign of surrender. To say that I am surrendered to you, God. I am surrendered, and, and here's the thing. You can have my present, and you can have my future, Lord, please take my past. So I want to pray for us as Melinda leads us into our offering and our communion. When I'm done praying, you can, you can make your way forward to collect the elements. If you came prepared to get today, we'll have the buckets up here and give them line. But I want to pray with us with your hands still lifted high. Father, thank you. Father, we are unworthy to come before you. There's nothing good in us outside of you. We are, we, we don't deserve to have your grace and we don't deserve to have your mercy. And half of the things that happened to us were because we chose to do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it without any understanding of repercussions and we made bad decisions. And so there's a part of us that feels like we deserve this, like it's a punishment for our bad ideas and our bad ways of choosing to live. But you said, but you said that, that I am a new creation. That I am not bound to the past. I don't live there anymore. Those things don't define me. And so, Lord, take the irrational fears that are attached to who I used to be. Lord, take the irrational fears from our hearts. And Lord, make us a new creation that, that the only thing we have reverence for is you. The only thing we have fear for is you. That the enemy can surround us, but we know that, that those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. Lord, open our eyes to see the spiritual battle that, that, that you are working. That you are working for us. In favor of us. In spite of us. 
So Lord, with every hand that's been raised and every heart that's been opened, I pray that your Holy Spirit has come down in this place. Lord, begin to fill the, the voids, be, begin to fill the gaps. Lord, hearts that have been broken, I pray right now that you mend them back together. For a mother or a father that's missing a child, I pray that you comfort them in the midst of their mourning. For a son, for a daughter that's missing their dad and their mom, Lord, I pray that you comfort them right where they are. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit begin to just penetrate them, to heal them. For somebody in here who has a diagnosis, then the doctor saying, there's no hope. There's not much more that we can do. For you are our physician. Yes. And so before I go to anybody else, I'll come to you, the master, and ask, what do we do now? What do we do now? Don't be afraid. Father, we love you. Have your way in us, through us. Open our eyes to see. Open our hearts to love the way that you love. Father, it's your name that we, we pray to, Lord. It's your son that you sacrificed for us that has opened the door. We ask these things through the authority of your Son, Jesus Christ. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.